Good morning and welcome to another episode of Business and Legal Q&A Live. Today is June 10th and today we're going to be talking about starting a business on a limited budget. And it's something that that I hear all the time. People call up and they say, you know, listen, I, I need to start a business. I've got this great idea. I can do it. I don't need a lot of capital, but I don't know where to start and I have a limited budget. Where do I put the money? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I want to make a couple announcements before we get going. First of all, as always, we're streaming live on YouTube Live, and we're giving Meerkat another try. So right now we are streaming live on Meerkat. For those of you who will be tuning in on Meerkat, um, you know, give me some feedback. Let me know if Meerkat and the platform works with the show. All right, before we get going, I do want to thank our sponsor. Today's show is sponsored by LiveTraders.net. Now, have you ever wanted to invest in the stock market, but you don't know where to begin? You know, it, the nuances and, and, and the skill that you have to have in order to figure out where to invest, it, it takes time and it takes a lot of education. And, you know, you might be a little um, lacking in confidence and you're afraid of investing your money without knowing where you're putting it, what you're investing in and what the return might be. Well, if that's you, then check out LiveTraders.net. Uh, LiveTraders.net offers education and training for traders and investors who want to trade the stock market for a living. They also offer a live trading broadcast, which is really cool, where traders can watch them trade live. LiveTraders.net also offers a newsletter for part-time traders where they will post all the trades that they will be making. So check that out. That is LiveTraders.net. Links to the site will be posted in the show notes. And um, again, you know, if you are looking to invest in the stock market, check it out. It's a pretty cool site and uh, it's a pretty great service. So thanks to LiveTraders.net for sponsoring the show. All right. Now we are going to move into our topic. And, and the question that was asked that we're going to answer was asked by Stacy Kincaid. So Stacy, thank you for your question. And her question is, I want to start a new business but I have a limited budget and I don't know where to spend my money. Can you give me some advice? So let's take a look at where you, know, you need to go to start the business and then where you need to spend your money. Because if you talk to small business attorneys, what they're going to tell you is that you need to hire them to do everything. You need to hire them to start up the company, to uh, register your LLC or whatever other business entity. And I want to tell you um, that that's not really true. If you are operating on an unlimited budget, then sure, go get your attorney, let him or her do everything. It makes it much easier for you. But I'm not talking to people today who are operating on an unlimited budget. I'm talking about people who are operating on limited funds, and that's what Stacy's question is. So let's look at where you have to go to begin and then I'll tell you where you need to spend money and when you need an attorney, okay? So first of all, you've got the business setup, which is the first step, and that's going to involve, for the initial stages, picking a name for your company, uh, um, you registering that name, getting it, it, it up and running for tax purposes with the state and a federal employment identification number. These are not complex things. These are things that you can do on your own. Now, you might want to consult with an attorney who can advise you as to the best business formation or business um, um, type for you, okay? Most startup businesses are, are leaning towards LLCs because you have the liability protection of a corporation, but it's much easier to file, much easier to maintain, uh, much easier for tax paying purposes as well. So you might want to consult with an attorney. We do that all the time. You know, we'll get somebody that calls up and says, listen, we want to retain an attorney for a limited, um, you know, amount of time just to ask questions. So don't be afraid to get an attorney for an hour or two, just so you can ask some questions. 
But if you're operating on a limited budget, don't blow all your money on the setup with an attorney because that is something that you can do. So how would you go about doing that? Well, it depends on what state you're in. But every state has a website where you can go and set up your business. Nearly all of them allow you to do it online, and it's really simple. It just takes a little bit of time, and it just takes a little bit of, of reading. All you have to do is follow the steps to set up your company. So let's assume for a second you're going to set up an LLC. You go to your state's website, right? So in New Jersey, you would go to the New Jersey Business Gateway, and the site says to you, what do you want to do? And you say, start a business. And then it tells you exactly step by step what to do. You don't need an attorney to do that for you. So on a limited budget, and welcome to everybody who's joining us on Meerkat. Um, we're talking today about starting a business on a limited budget. We're answering a question that uh, one of our listeners has submitted. So going through the setup stage saves you probably a little over a thousand dollars on an attorney if you can set your business up yourself. So you follow the step-by-step -step directions on the website, you pay your fee, and you've got your LLC. Now, depending upon your state, let's stick with New Jersey for a second, you then have to file for state tax registration. And that's another free form done online, and it walks you through that process as well. And then you apply for your federal tax identification number, which is through the federal government's website, but again, free step by step. So you don't need to spend any of your budgeted money on an attorney at that point. Now, certain states require an LLC to have an operating agreement. New Jersey, for example, does not. Is it a good idea? Sure, but do you really need, assuming that your state doesn't require an operating agreement, do you need one if you are a, uh, a single member LLC, meaning you have no employees, you have no partners, it's just you, do you need to spend the money on having an attorney draft an operating agreement? No. More importantly, even if you are not a single member LLC, you are perhaps, um, you know, a partnership. Do you need to have an attorney draft an operating agreement? You know, that's a tricky question, but I'm going to say no, because there are so many forms online that allow you to download a sample operating agreement. And as long as you and your partners are, you know, with, with in reason, um, on the same level of understanding about how the operation should go, you can take one of these forms and you can create your own operating agreement. You don't need an attorney for that. Now, where you will need an attorney, remember I'm telling you, you know, when you need to use an attorney, when you don't, is if you are going to have partners and you need to draft a partnership agreement. Partnership agreements can be tricky because in a partnership agreement, you are going to want to identify what could happen, how you could remedy that, what would happen if a partner wants to leave, for example, what would happen if a partner gets sick, what happens if it's a short-term sickness versus a long-term sickness. Those are things you want spelled out in the partnership agreement. So if you have partners, then I suggest that you retain an attorney to help you create the partnership agreement because while things are great at the beginning of a business, Everybody is like, you know, kumbaya, everybody's happy, everybody's ready to go. And then six months later, a year later, one partner thinks that you're spending money inappropriately. The other partner thinks that you're, you know, taking money away from his share. And before you know it, the whole thing implodes. And now you've got partners suing each other. So with a partnership agreement, you're going to be able to protect yourselves, all of you. And that's what you want to do. But that I would suggest getting an attorney for because you can download partnership agreements, but they're not going to be individually tailored to your needs. Operating agreements, different. And like I said, your state might not even require it, so why spend the money, uh, the money on an attorney to do that? So you have now gone through the initial setup and registration and filing of your business on your own without an attorney. It's not intimidating, it's not scary, it's a step-by-step, -step, read the website, follow the directions, get yourself registered, pay the fee, and you are done. Now, a lot of times, like I said, 
if you're an unlimited budget startup, sure, get an attorney, have them do everything for you. But if you're limited budget, these are things you can do yourself. Now, the other thing that you're going to want to think about, and this isn't necessarily a legal issue, it's a business issue, and that's branding. So instead of spending the money, let's say it's twelve to $1,500 for an attorney to do a, a setup for your initial business setup. Instead of spending that money on an attorney, take that money and start applying that towards your branding. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're a startup business, you need to identify yourself through your brand. And you do that through logo design and creation of stationery, having continuity in your products and websites and, and service. So spend your money on logo development. Now, I want to talk for one second about logo development uh, because it's something that, that people um, shy away from or they'll try to do it themselves because they think it's going to cost too much money. There are so many affordable ways for you to get your logo designed by a professional. I'm going to give you a few, and I want to say that none of these um, companies that I'm going to speak about I have no connection with them. I don't receive any sort of referral fee or um, any other agreement with them. They're just companies that I've used in the past, and I figured that it would be worth it to share them with you. Uh, the one that I like the best for logo design is a company called thelogocompany.net, T-H-E, logocompany.net. And um, thelogocompany.net, for around $125, will design a professional logo for you and they'll allow you to make as many modifications as you want, which is really cool because a lot of times, you know, you'll get a logo and you just don't like the way it looks and you're stuck with it. But with logocompany.net, you can go and, and they can, you know, modify it as many times as you want until you're satisfied. Again, I'm not connected with them or affiliated with them. It's just a company that I've actually used and I'm very happy with their services. So $125 gets you a new logo. If you don't want to spend that much, you can go on a site like Fiverr where you can buy a, a logo um, for $5. Sometimes it's a little bit more. Obviously, you do get what you pay for, so you have to be aware of that. But the branding is really something that is critical nowadays. You know, it's always been important, but I think today, especially with um, e-commerce and online businesses, people sometimes overlook branding, even if you're going to just operate a podcast or a passive income business, you need to have something that identifies you. So don't spend your money on a lawyer to set up your business. Spend your money, budget your limited amount of money on logo design. Now, now let's talk a little bit more about branding. You may want to consider filing a trademark application for whether it's your logo, whether it's your slogan, um, whether it's your graphic, whatever it might be. Now, again, welcome to everybody who's joining me on Meerkat. We're talking about operating a business on a limited budget or starting up a business, I should say, on a limited budget. So um, what do you do with trademarks? Well, here is an area where I would recommend that you probably use an attorney to file the trademark application, and, and I'm going to tell you why. So Trademark applications are lengthy and they're complex, even if you use the simple version of the trademark application. So when you file for your trademark, you have to pay a fee. And off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is, but it's around $250, maybe $325. And when you submit that fee to the trademark office, if your application is rejected for whatever reason, you don't get your money refunded. They keep your money, and then you have to pay again to submit the you know, revised application. That's why I think you use an attorney, because you don't want to have to keep spending money for your trademark application because you've made a minor mistake. So in that instance, I think it's worth it to take your money that you were going to use a, a, as a setup a, a account for an attorney, get an attorney to do your trademark, and again, there are nuances with trademarks. You don't have to necessarily have a trademark registered. You're permitted to use you know, uh, a service mark, an SM or a TM, following your 
your slogan, your logo, whatever it might be, even if it's not registered. And the courts will look at if there's ever a dispute, um, first use, and that sort of thing. But that's a complexity that you, you don't need to deal with on your own. Get an attorney to do that. Now, I want to talk for one second about something that comes up all the time, which is what's LegalZoom? How do I use LegalZoom? What do I think about LegalZoom as an attorney? LegalZoom may have its place, um, but I've heard horrific stories with respect to some of the services that they provide. Well, first of all, a number of years ago, um, there was a lawsuit against them because they were having paralegals answer the phone or non-legal professionals, and they were giving out legal advice. So that was all remedied. Um, but some of the services provided by LegalZoom are good. And, and you know, it's, it's a good website, and you can go and you can get some limited budget legal work done. Um, but there are certain things that I would say don't go to LegalZoom for because you don't know who's actually doing the work for you. Right? Is it an attorney? Is it a paralegal? How is it working? They, it says right on their site that it's not necessarily a, a, a lawyer or replacement for a lawyer. So for something like a trademark application, I would not go to LegalZoom. I would find an attorney in your area that you can communicate with on a regular basis if need be, that you can explain your concept and why you want to trademark something and how you want it to work. I wouldn't go with something like LegalZoom for that. So where are we in our discussion? We have saved you money on hiring a lawyer to set up your business because we've told you to do it yourself because you can. Step by step, follow the directions, bang, you just saved yourself $1,200 to $1,500 in attorney's fees on doing startup yourself. Where might you need to spend money on an attorney? Partnership application or partnership agreement, I should say, and trademark application. Where are you going to spend the money so far that you've saved by not having to use an attorney for the startup? On branding, logo design. And I've given you two companies or um, you know websites that you can go to to check out those logo designs. All right. So now let's move into where else are you going to spend this money, this limited budget money that you've saved by not hiring an attorney? Let's say that it's the $1,500 that an attorney would have charged you to set up your business. You've saved that money because you've done it yourself. And you've taken from that $1,500, $125 for logo design. Maybe you hired an attorney to do your trademark application and you, you paid your fee. So maybe you're in somewhere around um, you know, five or $600 expended. And let's say for easy figuring, now we've still saved you 1000 and you've got a thousand left over, what do you do with it? Well, one of the most important things that you can do as a startup is to make sure that you have a good accountant because an accountant can help you and save you a tremendous amount of grief, frustration, and aggravation as your business grows. You don't want to be stuck with a major tax bill because you didn't file quarterly taxes or you didn't understand how it worked. So spend some of that money that you've saved by setting up the business yourself on getting an, an accountant that you can have a good relationship with. Accountants generally, uh, for, for small business, they're not going to charge you an arm and a leg if you get the right accountant, an experienced accountant that understands what it is they're doing. Um, so that's where you can put some of that money. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is as your business starts to grow and develop, you still have that $1,000 of found money that you saved by not hiring the attorney at, at the setup. So let's talk about where you would need to hire an attorney, okay? So you're set up, you've got your business going, you're up and running. Let's say you are a service business or you are a retail business. Depends on what you are. You may need to have contracts drafted for your client. So let's say, for example, you're a landscaper. You need to have certain things in place to be a landscaper in most states. So for example, in New Jersey, you need to know that you have to have a home improvement contractor's license to operate as a landscaper in New Jersey. How would you know that? Well, there are two ways. A, you pay an attorney to tell you that, or B, 
you do your own due diligence, you look on the website, and you 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 know you go to the Department of Consumer Affairs and you look to see if that's something that you need. You need to be licensed. And it tells you. And then it gives you the application and you do it yourself. Another money saving tip where well, you don't need an attorney. So if you think or you just want to check whether or not your business needs a license, go to your state's Department of Consumer Affairs. Search for the licensing department and then look at the list of things that you need to be licensed. Plumbers, electricians, home improvement contractors, landscapers, things like that. And if you see that you need to be licensed, you can do it yourself. Just file, you know, follow the step-by-step -step application and pay your fee. You're good to go. So you don't need an attorney for that. Now, if you're unsure whether you need a license, let, let's say you're going to be a home inspector and you don't know whether or not you need a license, sure, you could hire an attorney for a limited scope engagement to help guide you through the process of getting licensed, but save yourself the money and do it yourself. So the two places that you need to kind of write down and remember if you're going to start your own business, you need to go to your state's secretary of state or your, your business gateway website where you're going to start your business. That's where you're going to register your company. And then if you are a service or retail business that may need a license and you're not sure, you go to your state's Department of Consumer Affairs website. And I have to tell you, um, I've dealt with consumer affairs departments in probably 30 states. And for the most part, the people there are pretty nice and they're generally helpful. So if you don't know if you need a license, call them up and ask them before you start throwing money away on an attorney to set that up for you. Okay? So those are the two things you need to remember as far as where you need to go to do some of your own homework and save yourself some significant money. Because I know attorneys that would charge you over $1,000 to get you licensed if you needed a license for landscaping or home improvement. And you're now going to save that $1,000 as well when you're trying to start up your business on a limited budget. So that's something that's important. But now let's get back to the idea of contracts for the people that you're going to be selling to. So if you're a landscaper and you're going to have clients, I would recommend strongly that you have a contract. Some states require you to have a contract. If you're a plumber, an electrician, a home improvement contractor, you need to have a contract and that contract has to have specific language in it. So that's an area where you'd want to hire an attorney to help you create that contract. But because you've saved money by doing other things yourself, you've got money to now negotiate and find an attorney who is competent and who can write you a contract for your clients without having to charge you an arm and a leg. So here's a tip. When you are looking for an attorney for your business to do something like a contract, here's what you should ask them. How many small businesses have you worked with? How many have you worked with in the past year? How many contracts have you written? Are you familiar with the provisions of, you know, in this case, your landscaper, landscaper contracts with clients? If they are not confident and they can't say to you, yes, and I know what language needs to be included in there, and, you know, we can do it for you in two or three hours or, or you know, an hour and a half or whatever they, they say, then you need to find another attorney. Uh, another tip about finding an attorney on a limited budget is don't go to an attorney that you get a referral from somebody in the family uh, who might be their divorce attorney or their real estate attorney. You need somebody that can handle small business. So just because, you know, Aunt Millie says I use, you know, Jim Bob um, to, to do my will and you should use them for your business. No, you don't want that because you're going to spend more money because that kind of attorney doesn't know the requirements. So you're going to want to spend some money on the attorney to create the contract for your, your, your clients so that you make sure you have the right provisions in it. What do I mean by right provisions? Well, take for example, New Jersey, and let's say you're a home improvement contractor. Well, you need to have a paragraph and it needs to be a certain size font. It needs to be bold and it needs to say that you have a three-day right to cancel this contract, et cetera.
you might not know that. And that is something that's generally found in a regulation or a statute. So that might be a little more difficult for you to kind of find what you need to have in the contract. So that's where you spend your money on the attorney. Where else might you need to spend your money on an attorney? Well, for your employment agreements. And to a limited extent, okay, you don't need to go out and hire an attorney if you are going to bring in one employee. You can do that yourself too. There are plenty of self-help um, forms and, and instructions that are listed on your state's employment site. You know, don't be afraid to go to your state's resources that they have and look there first because you can find sample employment agreements, sample at will employment agreements, and those things are also readily available on the internet. Maybe you want to hire an attorney just to revise or review something that you've drafted, but you don't need to go out if you're going to hire one employee and spend tons of money. You know what you should do if you're going to hire an employee? Check with your accountant because you want to make sure that your accountant is telling you what you have to do with this new employee, what forms you have to get them to sign. You know, for tax purposes, what do you have to pay with your payroll tax? So, you know, I think that that's where you need to go for resources if you're going to hire one employee. But we're not talking about bringing in a workforce of 30 people because we're talking about a startup on limited budget. So I want to give you some advice, too, about things you should be looking for when you're hiring an employee, things that you should consider. So first of all, you're going to hire an employee. Maybe you don't need a physical employee. Maybe you don't need somebody that's in your location with you. Now, there are plenty of businesses, an accountant, um, you know, some other sort of sales person, um, you know, you don't need to have somebody in the office with you. So what can you do to save money? And you could try outsourcing. And I know that outsourcing has always kind of had in the past this negative connotation where, you know, you're sending work overseas and what about people in America and, and you could be giving that business locally, et cetera. I know, but this is different because first of all, the culture is different. Things have changed. And outsourcing, to me, doesn't have that same negative connotation. You know, it's really tough to start a business nowadays. The economy is still not that great. There's a lot of competition. Um, and, and, you know, you want to try to save money everywhere you can. So I'm going to give you some suggestions. Take a look at outsourcing some of your work. Um, there's tons of books out there. Chris Ducker has written a great book. Um, and a lot of these guys that are doing passive income strategies and marketing and sales, they talk about it all the time, but it does work. Uh, you can go to sites like, um, I believe it's now Upwork, uh, which used to be, uh, I can't remember the other name of it, but um, maybe it's partners with Elance or something like that. But Upwork is one where you can go and you can get a freelancer to help you do something. They have virtual assistants. They have... Um, you know, people that can help you create a website, people that can help you generate uh, some, some better SEO links, all, all sorts of things. And I'm going to give you some tips right now on how to select somebody who is a freelancer. So if you're going to go on a site like Upwork, which was Odesk, that's what it used to be called. So if you're going to go on a site and you're going to look for, for a potential assistant or employee, I want to give you some tips. First of all, you have to understand that while you're using this website, you're still, in theory, hiring an independent contractor. So I would suggest that you treat it the same way you would if you were going to hire somebody who's going to work in the office with you. Interview them. Okay, so for example, on something like Up, Upwork, um, you know, you post your job ad and you're going to get a lot of people to respond. So you need to screen them and make sure that you have somebody who is the right fit for you. Do they speak the language that you speak? Are they fully uh, familiar or well-versed in writing in, in the particular language that you need? If it's English, does that person that you're going to hire speak fluent English? Do they write English? 
you know, where are they from? What do they do? What are their qualifications? And don't be afraid to say to a potential candidate on a freelancing site, can we have a Skype call? Can we have a telephone conversation? Let's find out if we're going to work well together. If you do that, you're going to have a much higher likelihood of success than if you don't. Because that's when you hear all these horror stories about, oh, I tried to outsource and I got this person that was scamming me because they said they were uh, fluent in English, but they didn't even live here. Okay, so you hear these horror stories and then you don't want to make use of, of the, um, the freelance services, but you can save yourself a ton of money. Why? Why can you save yourself money by outsourcing? Well, A, they're an independent contractor and you don't have to pay employment tax on them. B, you only pay them for the work that they do, so you're not paying for somebody to sit in your office and answer the phone or make some photocopies when you don't need them. So if you're a startup on a limited budget, consider outsourcing before you go and spend money on an employee. I know that there's always been this idea that you know, you're becoming successful as you're growing and you're bringing in more people and you're expanding, but be careful because too growth that's too quick right um for a startup especially on a limited budget can be sort of devastating you could move too quickly and not have all the pieces in place you could bring in too many employees and then find yourself having to fire them because you just don't have the money to sustain it you think you might need it but you don't maybe your business is the type that goes through lulls maybe you have a high season and a low season season. Um, you know, you're a landscaper, maybe you do a lot of work in the spring and summer, but then come winter, especially if it doesn't snow, but it's still too cold to do groundwork, maybe your business slows down. So do you want to have an employee that now you're paying or do you want to have an outsourced person? So consider that, at least consider it and, and look at those sorts of sites. Again, if you want to look at uh, some books out there, look at that Chris Ducker book, um, talks about outsourcing. So that's just another thing that you might want to do. But treat that person as if they were in your office interviewing. Ask for the resume, ask for recommendations, talk to them, make sure they understand. And then when you give them an assignment, be crystal clear with what you want. Make sure they understand it. Because, you know, when you're dealing with somebody in person, you might be able to say, here, take this, copy this, staple this, put this together. And they get it because they're physically there. But when you are, are dealing with somebody across the internet, you have to be very, very clear. And if you're not clear, you're going to get work back. That's not what you need. And then again, you're going to say, oh, this outsourcing doesn't work. But if you handle it the right way on your end, it's going to save you time and it's going to save you money. So consider that. The other thing I want to talk about is um, the idea of renting space. So if you're going to be out looking for a rental property, a, a lease, right? You want to lease an office. You want to lease a, a warehouse, whatever it is. A lease is something that you do want to spend the money on an attorney to have them review because there are a number of different types of leases out there. And oftentimes landlords have attorneys who have prepared some of these leases. Sure. Some of them will use stock leases, but Oftentimes they're prepared and who do you think these leases are meant to protect and benefit? Certainly not you, the tenant. They're meant to protect the landlord. So if you're not familiar with lease agreements, commercial lease agreements, then you should make sure that you have an attorney in place to help you with that. Okay. Spend the money there. And it's not all that expensive to hire an attorney to negotiate, review, revise a lease agreement. But remember, we saved you almost $2,000 on attorney's fees at the beginning. So you should still have money left over theoretically to now go out and hire the attorney to help you with the lease. That's an important point. Here are some things that you want to consider or at least be aware of when you're dealing with a commercial lease. First of all, look at the lease term. Make sure you understand how long this lease is for. Um, anybody ever heard of a lease? They call it a five and five. What that means is that it's a five-year lease and you have a five-year renewal option. 
But if you're not familiar with these terms, you're really not going to know how to modify the lease agreement, how to request some changes. You're not going to know what you're looking for. So you don't want to get stuck with a lease that you're now glued to for the next five to 10 years. It's, it's not something that you, um, you know, you, you fit into anymore. Let's say that your business grows and now you're stuck with a, a one room office or a two room office, but you need more space. Are you stuck in for five years, 10 years? So that's something you need to consider. Another point with leases, commercial leases, is look for something that's called a triple net lease. You have to be aware of that. What is a triple net lease? That means that you, the tenant, are responsible for the taxes, for the repairs, for the insurance. If you are a startup on a limited budget, I would caution you against entering into a triple net lease because that means that if you rent an office space, let's say it's a house, a house zone for commercial purposes, and it's a triple net lease and the roof leaks, you're responsible for that. You don't want that responsibility. You know, you're trying to get your business up and running. You don't want to be entering into a triple net lease. So be aware of that as well. But again, these are complexities that you probably need to, to have an attorney help you negotiate. The other reason why you'd want an attorney on a lease issue is because an attorney provides you with a buffer between the landlord and the landlord's attorney and you. It's very hard to negotiate with a landlord when you have no ability to, to bluff. There's no buffer. You say to the landlord, this is what I want. He says no, and now you're like, okay, well, now what? He said no. There's nowhere to go. But when you've got that intermediary on a lease negotiation, you know, you've got some buffer because the attorney can say to the landlord, look, my client is blah, 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 and you, you can make some progress. So that's something where you'd want to spend the money um, for the attorney. So does that make sense? Because you don't need to spend the money where we've talked about. You don't need to spend it on business setup. Do it yourself. You don't need to spend it on uh, an operating agreement. Do it yourself. You don't need to spend it on hiring one employee. Talk to your accountant. Get the forms. Do it yourself. So you've saved all that money on the attorney. You know, I think as a business owner on a limited budget doing a, a startup company, you need to know when you need the attorney, when you don't, and what questions to ask. You need to have some general knowledge. You need to at least know some of these terms that I'm talking about so that when you hear triple net lease, when you're dealing with a lease negotiation or some real estate agent says to you, you're looking for a space. Oh, here, it's a triple net. Well, you need to know what that means because you could say, oh, that sounds great and not know and then get yourself into hot water. Now, the other thing that you need to do, uh, and this is something that's debated. People argue with me over this all the time. People say, I need a business plan. I need a written business plan. It needs to be, you know, I'm going to get one of these software programs and I'm going to write out this business plan. Do you need a business plan? You need a plan, okay? Do you need a formalized, let's go buy an app or software um, business plan? No, you really don't. You need to have an idea of where you are going and what you want to accomplish. And sure, it helps to write it down, but you don't need anything special. Don't go out and spend money on a, a business planning app or software. Just open up a Word document and just write down where you want to go, okay? That's what you need to do. You need to have some direction, some, some idea of where you want to take this company. If you are uh, like a bakery, what do you need to do? Where do you want to go? What's your goal for the next six months? What's your goal for the next year? Where are you going to market? Are you going to go and do local events? Are you going to spend money on Google advertising? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Who is your target market? Those are the things that you need to know. Those are the things you want to write down. But do you need a formalized business plan? No, I really, I think not. I think that you can do a business plan without spending all of the unnecessary time 
doing all of the formalized, what's my mission statement? I mean, my mission statement is to do a good job to make money and to sell my products and services. That's your mission statement. You don't need to write that down. So I would suggest that you do have a plan, okay? You need to know where you're going and how long you want it to take to get there. And I want to just give you some other advice as, as a startup. You have to be prepared for some pain because nothing comes without a little bit of pain. You are going to have to take your lumps. You're going to have to learn from your own experiences. And you have to be aware of that you know, because it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's hard work. And a lot of times, you know, I'll talk to people who have said, I don't understand this. Um, you know, I have a full-time job, but I started a business on the side and my business on the side's not working. Why? Well, the answer is because you didn't put enough effort and time into it. And maybe you would have been better off not starting that side business. Um, anybody out there watch that show Shark Tank? Now, I, I think it's a really good show to watch. I think you can pick up a lot of good tips from it. But, you know, one of the things that the, the guys on or, or gals on Shark Tank say to potential companies is this. They say, how much time are you spending on your company? Do you have another job? Are you really serious about this company? And look at how many of the people who have full-time jobs and are doing something on the side actually get an investment deal. And it's very few, if any, because you cannot devote enough time to two different things. You can't have a full-time job and then start a business on the side. Something's going to suffer. So you need to, to figure out what you want to do and be prepared for the negatives. Okay, now, also in, in this um, you know, discussion that we're having today on starting a business on a limited budget, I want to talk about websites and I want to talk a little bit about social media and what you can do with that. We've got about 17 minutes left, so I want to start with a discussion on websites. I want to tell you a quick story, real quick. had a client that came in uh, about a year and a half, two years ago with a proposal to have uh, a company do a website and they wanted to charge in excess of $250,000. And the website, sure, it was a little more complex than a basic website. But when that person shopped around, they found prices that ranged from $50,000 all the way up to $500,000 to go to a company to design a website for you. That's crazy. Unless you have a very complex website where you need that specialized knowledge. You're going to have uh, interactive elements that you can't find somebody else to do. You know, you, you can't get somebody um, who's a freelancer to do that. You, that's a different story. You're going to have a site um, that is something like a huge company would have, a, a massive company with lots of interaction like a UPS. Yeah, you need somebody that's really qualified. But we're talking about limited budget startups you don't need to spend even $10,000, even $5,000 on a website. So what's my advice on websites? I'm a big believer in do it yourself because as a startup, you are developing your ideas and your thoughts and you want things to be the way that you want them. You don't want to not, you know, to necessarily say, well, I've got this vague idea. Oh, and then you go pay somebody to do the site and you're not really happy with it. That's how I feel. I love being able to go in and develop my own site. And I'm not a, a website designer. I don't know HTML. I'm not uh, you know, somebody like that. But I'm proficient at computers. And I went in and, and my sites are, are used uh, or based off of the Wix platform. Now, again... I have no connection with Wix. I'm not an affiliate with Wix, but Wix is a company that I actually use and I happen to really love the way that their website integration um, works. So for small business startup, you could pay anywhere from $100 to $150 on Wix and you could have your site up and running. Now, I know that there's a ton of people out there 
that have affiliate um, opportunities with, with places like Bluehost. And I know that Bluehost pays a lot of money for affiliate links and that sort of thing. That's fine. I mean, if you want to go and explore those options, go ahead. Um, but you have to understand two things when you're going to be starting up and you, you need internet, okay, website. A, you need to have a website, hands down, plain and simple. I don't care what you do. You need to have an online presence. The other thing you need to be aware of is that most people are accessing the internet now through where? Through their smartphone, right? So all you guys out there watching on Meerkat, through my smartphone. So that's something you need to be aware of. And that's something that companies like Wix will allow you to do. They have a mobile um, function on their website builder that allows you to see what it would look like on a smartphone so that you can make sure that when people access your site in the, on a smartphone, it's not a jumble of words. It's not all you know bundled up together. So that's important because you need to be aware that how many, you know, how many people are using smartphones to access your site. All right, so, all right, we've got the website development and design, and you've got hosting, two different things. You need to make sure that you have a domain name, and this is something that you probably want to think about when you are originally starting up the company. When you're back picking the name of your business, when you're looking for the logo design and you're going to register your company, one thing that I tell people is go out and look for a domain name that matches your business or is something that you can identify with your business. A lot of people have started their own business and then come you know, in and said, oh, you know, I, I have this company and it's called, you know, Cake For You and I went to register the domain name six months later and it's taken. What do I do? Can I make them stop using that domain name? And the answer is no. So what I suggest is that before you register your company, you go out and you search to see if a domain name that you might want to use is available. So it's really important because there's only so many domain names out there. And I know there's so many variations, dot biz, dot org, dot, you know, all these things. What's, what's the most popular? Everybody knows it's dot com. So, you know, um, that's where you want to, to, to be. Um, there's a question on Meerkat. Are you recording a podcast? Uh, yes, this show streams live on YouTube Live, on Blog Talk Radio, and it's available for um, download on iTunes. It's free, of course. So, yep, we are uh, we have this being recorded as well. Um, but getting back to the point of of um, making sure your domain name is available, it's really important because that is part of your branding efforts. You want to make sure that your company, your website, it all is cohesive. That's going to make you have a strong brand that people identify with. Now, what about social media? Depending upon the business that you're in, let's say you sell cupcakes, certain social media platforms are going to be really, really home run hitters for you. Instagram might be great for somebody selling a product, especially something, maybe recipes or um, cupcakes or whatever, you want to also try to make sure that your social media handles are cohesive or the same, if possible, with your your other identities, right? Your your domain name, the name of your company. Now, I know it's hard because there's so many millions of people out there that have already taken the handle that you might want. That's all right. Just find something that that works for you that you can have a cohesive branding or brand identity with. So when you're starting business and you're on your limited budget, it takes you no money to do research on your own to look for your social media handles, to look for the domain names. This is all stuff you should be doing. And I know it's it seems like a lot, but make a list and go through this checklist Take this, this um, show that we did today, download it, save it, listen to it, and then make a checklist of the things that, that you know, I'm talking about. And go through one at a time and just tick off every one that you hit because it's important for you to save money on legal services by doing things on your own. 
I'm a big believer in spending your money on a lawyer the right way, not just simply saying, I don't know what to do. I'm going to hire a lawyer because if you get the wrong lawyer, you're going to be spending a lot of money and you're not going to be getting what you need. Now, again, just to reiterate, there are times throughout this process that you do need to hire a lawyer. And we've talked about that. Lease agreements, um, partnership agreements, contracts, if you're going to be hiring more than a few employees and you need real employment agreements, at will employment agreements or work for hire agreements. Yeah, those are things that you're going to want to hire an attorney for. But all of these other things we're talking about, you can do on your own and you should. It's going to save you a ton of money. Look for a lawyer that you can use as a consultant, somebody that you can bounce ideas off of. You know, we do that all the time. We'll make arrangements with people where they pay a, a limited amount, you know, a few hundred dollars a month or whatever it might be, and they're getting somebody that they can call for a few hours a month or, or what, however the arrangement works and say, look, I just want to bounce this off you or I want to just show you this agreement, um, see if this works. But they're doing the work themselves. And it's really important because as a startup, you can burn through money and then you're out of business. You know, I think that uh, getting back to the topic of social media, I think that the world has changed so much. That you need to really be focused on your online marketing in addition to your real world presence, your brick and mortar presence, if you will. Um, but you don't need to spend tons and tons of money on online companies. There are so many companies. You'll see what happens when you register your business. If any of you out there are already business owners, what happens within the first two weeks? You're inundated with mail and email and people are telling you that, you know, you're, you, they scanned your website and your SEO is, is screwed up and this is wrong and they can fix this. I don't know how these people manage to um, pounce on small business owners within the first week or two, but they sure do. You don't need that if you can just take the time to learn how to do certain things yourself, okay? Website design, use a company like Wix, do it yourself. Um, they even have, like at Wix, they have for, I don't know what it is, $100 or something, you can hire somebody to help you create the site. Go on sites like Upwork, get somebody, go on Fiverr, right? Have somebody come out and, and virtually create what you need. That's what you should do. Do that yourself, okay? And I'm talking about basic sites. Your landscaper, your bakery, your, even if you're going to sell product online, you don't need to go out and spend 10 grand on website design. I remember about, um, maybe it was eight years ago, nine years ago, I was working with a, a different law firm. I was a, a, becoming a partner at a firm and we were looking to build a website and they wanted to go out and spend like 20 grand on this basic website. And, and you know, I just couldn't agree with that because you don't need it. You don't need it. Maybe 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, the internet was brand new. Yeah, very difficult to go out and start your own website. You were using some of those free services that were provided by People like, you know, AOL, and, and they were difficult, no good, but not now. Nowadays, it's drag and drop. All right, we only have uh, six minutes left. I just want to touch on another few things that you should be doing on a limited budget when you're going to start up a business, and this is in the, the realm of online marketing, okay? We talked last week about landing pages. If you are trying to establish a um, an online business, maybe a passive income business. You even if you're not, even if it's if it's a product, a, a cupcake place that you're trying to sell, you should have a landing page. And landing pages are something that you can do through your website provider like Wix, or you can go out and you can hire a third party company. You can pay them like twenty five, thirty dollars a month, and you get a landing page. What is a landing page? Well, for those of you who don't know. A landing page is essentially a one page, let's call it a website, just because I don't know how else to describe it. It's a one internet page and it's very simple. It offers a download, it offers a product, a coupon, a service, and it's something that you know you might click to in a Google ad or you might click to from your homepage. I'll give you an example. 
So let's say that you're running a special, you're, you're this cupcake place we've been talking about, and you're running a special, you want to have a coupon. So you set your site up so that when somebody clicks on your homepage, you have a pop-up that comes up and it says 20% off click here. And um, you know you click there and it takes you to the landing page, which is a very basic, simple, standalone page. And all you have on that page is your brand identity, your logo. And then in the center of the page, you're going to have your coupon. And what do you want to do? What, what's the reason that you're bringing them to this landing page? Is it just to give them the coupon? No. It's to get their contact information. It's to get their email address because email is the way for you to develop a relationship with customers. I'm going to give you uh, a link later on before we end uh, for the YouTube channel and you can download or watch the video that we did on landing pages because it goes a little bit more in depth. But you want to develop this mailing list and that's what you do on a landing page. Capture their info. That's right. Somebody on, uh, on, on Meerkat just mentioned that. That's exactly what you want to do. Capture their info so that you can build a relationship with them. How do you build a relationship with them? Well, you've given them a coupon. You've given them a free book, a free e-report. And now you've captured their info and you're going to add them to your list and then you're going to want to use some sort of email service that you're going to be able to communicate with them on a regular basis, once a month, once a week, whatever it might be, and get them used to you, get them used to seeing your emails, and you have to provide them with good content. And again, right, today's topic is operating a business, starting up a business on a limited budget. You don't need a big budget to create content. You need to take some time. You need to give some thought to what you're doing. You need to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And regardless of whether you're selling a product or whether you are selling a service, customers, clients, that's who you need to appeal to. You need to understand your client. You need to understand how to communicate with them. And you know, the one thing that drives me crazy is people who are disingenuous when trying to sell a product or service, right? They just, they, they fill you with BS. Here's what we're going to do, but they don't really mean it. If you can't be honest with your customers, you're going to fail. You have to develop a relationship, a transparent relationship with people, whether you're doing um, passive income, selling or marketing, whether you have a brick and mortar, you need to be able to let people in to know you, to trust you. And that's why you don't want to just capture somebody's info from a, a, a landing page and then just start spamming them with email all the time. They're not going to trust you. You need to, to give them something. You need to go slow, build up a relationship. Because I forget what the percentage is, but it's somewhere around like 80 or 90% of the people don't buy the first time they visit your site. They want to come back and, and you know kind of build a relationship with you. All right, so we are running out of time. We've got about a minute left. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has tuned in live on YouTube Live and on Meerkat. Um, 90 seconds. For those of you who are looking for some additional information about this podcast, the website that you can go to is utlradio.com. And um, if you stick with me after the live broadcast on YouTube and Blog Talk Radio ends, I'm just going to go through the closing, and then I'll get to you guys on Meerkat with the, the rest of the information. Um, but I want to thank today's sponsor for the show. Today's show is sponsored by LiveTraders.net. Again, seconds. all of their information is listed in the show notes. And check them out if you're interested in learning how to be an online trader. That's going to do it for today. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow for Understanding Business when we will be speaking with Captain Lee of Bravo's hit show, Below Deck. He's back on for a second time, and we're going to go through a lot of questions that our audience has had for him. So that's tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern. You can watch live on YouTube Live or Blog Talk Radio. Download the show later. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all your comments and feedback. So we'll see you tomorrow. And remember that there's power in understanding the law. Mm -hmm.